All right, well, Jeff, if you want to kick it off, I'll just keep admitting people as they join. Uh, but uh, it is seven o'clock, so uh, uh, go ahead. I should also mention, by the way, that we are uh, recording this uh, uh, this chapter meeting so that people uh, who couldn't make the meeting will be able to, to log in and see it. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Jeff Maleska. I'm one of the board members and uh, technically vice president. Um, Janine asked me to fill in for her tonight as it sounds like she's unable to make it. Um, but uh, a few uh, administrative matters just before we get to our speaker, Von Snook, tonight. Um, you might have seen it in the email that Bob sent just the other day, but just a few reminders. First, um, we are having a uh, it's called the Wild and Scenic Film Festival, and that's going to be on Saturday, November 28th from 7 to 9. Um, it's a virtual film festival. It's uh, a, a compilation of a different, couple different types of videos, um, not just fishing related, but um, also regarding, uh, you know, conservation generally, um, outdoors, things like that. Um, tickets are fifteen dollars uh, a person. You're able to follow the link in Bob's email if you want to sign up. We uh, we really encourage you to do so. It should be a really great event. Um, and there are door prizes or a raffle of some sort. Um, I do not have those details now, but I I'll get those to you by the end of the meeting. Um, and then second, um, just as a reminder. Our annual meeting is going to be January 26th, 2021. So it's a few months away, but the reason it's uh, important is we are currently um, have put out a call for new board members to apply. Um, there was an email I know that was sent out, but um, the, the actual application itself should be available on our website. And the instruction is as to, um, where you return that uh, would be right in, in uh, the form itself. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, email um, any of us directly. Otherwise, we're currently on the board. Um, and uh, beyond those, um, tonight our speaker, as I mentioned before, is Von Snook of the DNR Fisheries offer Office in Lanesboro. Um, he is going to be talking about just uh, activities in the Southeast Drift List, um, stocking, easement acquisition, trout stream designation, brook trout disease testing reintroduction. Um, he, Bon is the Assistant Fisheries Supervisor at the DNR Lanesboro Fisheries Offices, and he's been with the DNR for almost 20 years. Um, I have not had the pleasure to meet Vaughn in person, um, but I know, um, I'm sure many of you have, and I know uh, many of our board members have. So uh, with that, uh, Vaughn, if you're ready, you can take it over. Okay, I've got a share screen here. Okay, I'm gonna turn over the, I think, are you able to share the screen, Vaughn, or do I need to no, give you No, it said, the, it said the host disabled participant screening sharing. Okay, let me see if I can uh, find a way to, to uh, make you the host. Okay, you are now the host, Vaughn, so you should be able to share your screen. Oh, but Vaughn, if you're the host, you may also be seeing people trying to join in the um, in the waiting room. Okay. So you, if you see them, just you just click admit and you can admit them. But you any, can any, also now. Okay. Uh, Anybody's can, allowed then. <laughs> I'm just yep. joking. <laughs> as long as they don't start throwing <laughs> zoom bombs at us or suggest that we stock our trout streams with carp they are welcome to join uh, Taman, we're going with Taman. we're going to stock them with Taman. Taman. <laughs> let me see here how about that 
I see it. So I assume everybody else does too. And we see your note slide too. Hmm. Okay. So let me just switch screens here. Let me see here. Sorry. Do, do, do. Hmm. Let's do this. I've got uh, a drum set of screens here that I use to do GIS with. So I've got to figure out which which symbol I'm using, I suppose, here. So hold on a second, sorry. No, not going to work. Every time I've tried that, Vaughn, it always shows up the presenter view. Okay, so... You, it, to, you just got to go with the straight slideshow. That's what okay. I always end up doing. Okay. Just right off of this? Or off of this? Yep. Okay, no problem. I'll minimize that so I don't have to be bothered by it. So, hey, uh, what was that, Benji? Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, you should be able to do presentation or start this slideshow, but not in the presenter view where it shows your next slide. Yeah, good luck with and, that. And Vaughn, you have a message from Zach. You have to let some people in from the waiting room. Uh oh, <laughs> we're going to make you multitask. I'm this sorry about a, that. I didn't, gonna, no, I didn't realize drums. you were going to have to let people in and uh, eating controls. Hmm. Five people view. Uh, admit. Yep. Joining. Admit. 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 Yeah, there should be an admit all at the top too. Oh, there. Okay. There you go. Uh, DNR uses Skype a lot. We, we have only done, I've only been on one Zoom thing. So, so this is a first. So I think I've admitted everybody. And taking this to presenter only without going into the screen is not possible. So we're just going to wing it from right here. I think we can see it just fine. Yeah, yeah, for this purpose, I suppose. So glad everybody's joining. Um, I'm usually a big face reader in my presentation. So I see people falling asleep or I see people really excited and passionate about something. Um, and I might add some more things to it, uh, but I can't this time. So um, we're gonna, I'm gonna do my best. Um, if you have questions, I know there's several ways in Zoom to ask a question. Somebody might have to help me with that, but I know there's several ways to do that. You can also, there'll be a, an email in here. I'm at my email address and my office phone number in the presentation here that you can, you're always welcome to call me. Um, most DNR staff right now, if they can, are teleworking, meaning they're at home doing report writing, approving invoices, writing plans, uh, doing environmental review, et cetera. Um, but if we uh, come into work, um, if we come into work, um, we're going to be we're seeing the screen, not him, for some reason. I don't know. No, my, my, uh, you're not seeing me because I don't have a camera on my state uh, on my state computer. So all you'll see of me is Vaughn Snook on, on the screen. But hopefully you can see my presentation. So let's go to this next slide here. So I'm going to talk about. There's 40 slides here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, staffing. I, th I don't think some of you are familiar with the staffing changes that we've had here in the office. Um, let me get this here, admit all. Um, where I'm going to talk about stocking. I know that you were sent a survey or poll uh, or whatever you want to call it um, from National to you about stocking. Um, and, I, and I'm I'm not so sure most people knew anything about what we do here. So I'm going to try to fill you in on that. Um, I knew there was some, um, I, I heard there was some interest in, in, in talking about brook trout reintroductions. Uh, we call them reintroductions rather than stockings. And I can describe to you why that's the case. Uh, then we got some stuff that we did this summer that I want to go through. We also did, uh, there's a, a big section um, uh, that we've done this summer on trout stream designations. 
the state of Minnesota designates trout streams as trout streams. Um, I can go through that process. We also completed a, a Creole angler survey. I wouldn't doubt that some of you were surveyed uh, this summer when you were fishing. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, easements and funding for easements that we've got. So it's, it's important that um, if you haven't ever been to the Lanesboro's Fisheries web page before that you, you do so if you want to um, keep up with some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, our long range plan is there for PDF that you can spend a day reading. Um, you can the, the web the website here is on that in that in that link there, but you, you can also just go to the main DNR web page in the top right window. There's a search a search window, and you can type the words Lanesboro in that top right window, and hit search, and it'll come up. I think it's the first thing. I hope it's the first thing. I'm still clicking, people wanting to come. Um, so in that on that Lanesboro site, we've got, I, for instance, recently we've had a lot of people asking about the towns and parks season and where, where is the end of that open area in Rushford, where is that open area in Forestville, whatnot. So that those maps are there. Um, it's got, I think it's got at least one or two presentations of mine that are PDF there. Um, it also has some past habitat improvement projects um, that are listed there with the slideshow stuff that you can look at. They're kind of, kind of nice to see. So here's staffing. So I've got three columns there on the far right, 2005, 17, and 20. So uh, I began in, in this office in 2004. And so the 2005 represents right when I got here what we had. Um, the rose colored or whatever that is, uh, those three lines there are the, the habitat crew. Um, Steve Erickson retired uh, this last year and we hired a habitat supervisor. Um, so if you guys are wanting to have a presentation uh, in your meetings regarding habitat and what we've been doing, uh, Jim Melander would be your man to do that. So he was hired just this last year. Um, Blake Lee, one of our heavy equipment operators retired. So we're now down to just one seasonal equipment operator. Um, we're waiting for a hiring freeze to stop. We're waiting for COVID to go away just like everybody else is. So uh, that's not gonna happen until then. So the, the Habitat crew is working with two people now, which is really challenging. Um, the chartreuse uh, colored two lines there are regional staff, staff that are not in my office and that, that don't normally uh, help us with data activities, month activities. They do their own thing, uh, but we do work with them. Um, so we have, I think I counted here, I think we have seven total staff in our office now. We used to have 11. Um, so staff has been cut. Um, the, base, the base staffing for a fisheries office right now is a super, a specialist, a technician, and the OAS, the Office Administrative Specialist. Um, that's base. There's 28 fisheries offices in the state uh, and that's base. That's considered, don't ever drop below that. So um, I just hope that uh, some of these, we've got some things here that we need to do some hiring for and, uh, but there is some changes. So if you have any habitat, I'm trying to get people to talk to Jim Melander. He's, he's very knowledgeable. Um, and if you want a presentation on habitat, as I said, I would talk to Jim. So we're gonna talk about brown trout stocking. Um, as I said before, you the National TU sent you a, a survey and what your feelings were on stocking and what was needed and what was not needed, what you thought or what your thoughts were. I'm gonna go through uh, brown trout fingerling stocking first. Oops, I see I admit somebody up here. Um, brown trout fingerling stocking. So those guys are, are about three inches long. The, the, the hatcheries, rate them so there are about 250 of them per one pound uh, we put them in a net and they rate them that way they're usually rated to go out of the hatcheries uh, especially lanesboro does most of the brown trout production um, lanesboro state fish hatchery right across the road from me here and they're ready to go those little browns are ready to go usually the, by starting the fourth week of may um, and we try to get them all out by second or third week of june 
Um, we have been discontinuing a lot of brown trout stocking. Just for your information, uh, northeast uh, Iowa, we talk to those uh, biologists down there a lot in Iowa, and um, they've completely, completely zero stopped brown trout fairling stocking in northeast Iowa. Uh, I was really surprised uh, that Mike told me that he'd done that, but they have, and um, I think that's great. Um, they did it for several reasons. It, none of it had to do with um, money or anything. It was because they didn't uh, they didn't really need to stock anymore. So the reasons that we've we've stopped stocking, um, there's been some situations where we've had uh, we know there's competition with brook trout, and there's no reach throwing you know a couple hundred pounds of of brown trout, little brown trout on top of some brook trout. That's not very logical to me. So. Uh, that took place in some some areas. We also do a, a natural reproduction check in um, just before we stock brown trout fringlings. I can I could go, go into big detail about that, but it basically is a way for us to tell how how successful is this year's nat natural reproduction. So we, we do that literally just before, like a couple of days before we stock, and we check to see if we see any natural reproduction. So we know what we're seeing. Little guys, little three inches are not from the hatchery because we haven't stocked yet. So we looked to see that and we found, you know, most streams in Southeast Minnesota, more streams than we even know um, are producing sufficient numbers of natural brown trout. Uh, so that's been the big stop there. Um, and then let me see here in the early, mid, mid 2000s, late 2000s, um, we were looking closely at our stocking program and, and before many supervisors before the current one, we used to stock areas where the landowner uh, stated that, he, you know, he or she, well, we allow anglers here, uh, but there weren't state angling easements. So we were putting, using um, basically your tax dollars to produce brown trout and put them in places that were, that could be shut down. And we found out that to be a significant thing. We found out that some, oh no, I haven't let anglers in here for years. They did this to me, they did that to me. Uh, so we were putting brown trout in areas where you couldn't access them. So we stopped that immediately. Um, let me go to the next here. So here, there's gonna, bunch, gonna be a bunch of these tables. I hope they're not too boring. They're really interesting to me, but I'm a fisheries guy. So uh, you can see that in, in the early 2000s, we, um, discontinued a, a huge set of uh, of our brown trout fingerling stocking. Uh, these were mostly, you know, natural, basically those three reasons. Um, a lot of these though were, were stocking, stocking private water where landowners had previously said that they did allow anglers and now they don't. So that was all dropped. So there's 257 to 500 that are no longer being stocked. Um, these have on this uh, slide have all been either discontinued. Oh, let me get in here. Another person wanting in. So um, these have all been either discontinued or reduced. Um, let me go through here. What did I want to say here? So these were in 2017. I made a big push to to move this. Oh, this. So this one. So you can see like row three six, seven, eight, nine there. Um, we stock them every other year, 18,000 biennial stocking in the middle branch whitewater every other year. And we, we were doing that for reasons so that we could evaluate the stocking. So if you stock this year and you don't stock next year, and then you stock the year after that, et cetera, et cetera, you can do an electrofishing assessment and you can see where your missing year classes are. If you can't see, where you're missing your classes are, then that means your stocking probably isn't doing anything. Um, so because of the lack of staff to get all these things done and do other stuff that we thought was more important, we decided to drop the evaluation part of this. And mostly in most cases, I just cut it in half, um, the total numbers in half. So this is, so it's kind of confusing down here in the bottom because it's every other year. So. Basically, 
the summary here is here's a hundred here's a hundred nine thousand additional ones that we've cut uh, and this this also makes it really m much easier for the hatchery when they know that they every year they produce nine thousand brown trout fringlings for middle branch whitewater it's not alternating or anything it makes it much easier for them so here is today so I've got two slides on uh, today what we're doing today this year. So um, let me see here, Camp Creek. Uh, I saw Mike Tomaszek on this list here. So um, th these are stocked way, way, way up almost to the quarry and the headwaters. We have a real nice long easement up there and the headwaters um, and those are stocked up there. Uh, Deshi Creek, there's a lot of these that, that work I just want to let you know that we are considering discontinuing again. I, I, I am of the complete belief that if we discontinued all of these today, this year, there isn't one of you that would know the difference. I, I really do believe that. I, I'm not being mean to you or anything, uh, but angling, number one, is really hard. At, at, it's not a very good indicator of, of anything as far as fisheries assessments are concerned. But it, there are so many fish that we're producing down here I wish I could convey to you uh, the numbers of little trout that are just just they're almost gonna walk on their backs you know and comes June and and July there are just so many trout down here it's just almost ridiculous so um, you can see the south branch of the roots got we, we manage our trout streams it's a fisheries term and uh, by reach so you can see reach 1a 1c reach 2a so a reach is is um, how we apply fisheries management. So uh, for example, 1A, reach 1A on the south branch of the Root River is from its confluence with the root all the way to the dam. Um, 1B is actually the reservoir. 1C is above the reservoir to Preston. And because those water types change, you know, one below the dam is a different type of habitat and different, it's a totally different river than is the reservoir, obviously. Um, so we, we apply fisheries management regulations and easement, pri easement acquisition priority and habitat improvement and everything that we do based on reach. Reach is the unit of fisheries management that we apply fisheries management. So here's the second page. Let um, me look at this. Anything interesting here? So just for your information, the kettle number there is a way, it's, it's kind of interesting, it's a, it's a way for me to help, uh, to help me we do have several streams that are named the same, uh, but it also helps me when I give presentations to look at it. Um, for example, uh, the South Fork of the Root is zero, it starts with M, which is Minnesota. 009 is the Root River, and 010 is the South Fork of the Root River. So 009, where did they come up with nine? So guess what Winnebago Creek is? The most, the first trout stream in Minnesota off the Mississippi River is M, 001. So the Root River is the first tributary or the ninth tributary off the off the Mississippi as you as you move upstream. So 010 is the it's like the, the thigh bones connected to the some of these kettle numbers get many many digits long if they're little tribs way up in the headwaters. It's the tenth tributary and the fourth tributary and the first tributary and the ninth tributary etc. So I've got lots of these memorized as this is what I do all day long. So um, but to give you, so to sum this up here, uh, we have, we stock brown trout fairlings. Um, I'm trying to do two things at once here. How is the natural production? And should, I, should we go through these at the end maybe or not? How should we handle these? Can you guys see these questions? Uh, and I'll try to go to them at the end here. Uh, Vaughn, I'm sorry, you're trying, do you have a slide with some questions or? Uh, you can't see my, yeah, okay, you can't see this that I've got up. There. Yeah, we're it's, still. It's the chat. Oh, okay. The chat, people are asking me questions and yes, maybe we should just wait until the end and do it at the end. So you'd like to answer questions at the end? I think that's. Um, it's probably easier, yeah. Yeah, so, so all is as Vaughn said please go ahead and type your yeah, questions type them in, in the chat yeah. and and Vaughn can address them at that time yeah so to sum up this slide here we're stocking 90 well, about 90 miles 
of our 750 miles of designated trout stream. That equals about 12% of our total trout stream miles in southeast. So I always get these, we've got a, we've gotten on a huge number of people thinking this summer and last summer, um, they'd call up, when are you stocking? What do you mean? When are you stocking so-and-so creek? I'm like, we don't stock so-and-so creek. Well, then they get really mad at us, mad at us on the phone. I said, there, there's so many trout in so-and-so creek that when's the last time you fished so-and-so creek? You know, people just, I think people wanted to go out and I think a lot of people assume that every trout in Southeast Minnesota was stocked. I, I don't know where they got that idea, but it's actually, the, what I'm trying to convey here is that it's actually the opposite. We, we don't do a lot of stocking. Uh, let's talk about rainbow trout stocking here for just a bit. Isn't that a pretty fish? Let me go back to that. I think that's a really pretty rainbow. I think that was in Winnebago. Um, what do we got here? So we stock two two different life stages of, of rainbow trout. We stock fingerlings, which are the 250 to the pound, and we stock yearlings. So I'm gonna talk about fingerlings first. Um, we've actually had some pretty good, we, we kind of dabbled in this because they're fairly inexpensive to produce um, relative to the yearlings. Um, and for example, um, we, what is today's 2020, 2018, we electrofished a 19 inch rainbow that had to have come from fingerling stocking in the South Fork of the Root, way, way, way upstream where the mouth of Blagsvet Creek comes in. It was like a mini steelhead. Um, and I've had several anglers comment to us, where did these rainbows come on Weisel? You know, they're, they were 14 inches. Do you guys stocking? And those came from the fingerling stocking. So, and then I've, and, and vice versa or counter to that, we've had people in Preston tell us, what are these little rainbows you're stocking? They're six inches long. <laughs> and, and they're thinking we're stocking yearling rainbows at six inches long. And I say, no, no, those are, those are from fingerlings. Those have been there for a year or two, maybe two years. And they, they, they calm down and, and realize that, that that's kind of cool then. So uh, what we hope to do is that they, they become more naturalized and, and they're prettier and uh, healthier, chunkier, et cetera. So this is a list of, so there's two slides of this. This is a list of our rainbow trout yearlings. So these are one year old, um, oops, uh, one year old, um, I've, I've, I've uh, sorted them here by the most at the top. Um, so we put 7,500 uh, rainbow yearlings in Lanesboro Park Ponds every year. If you were to drive down there today, I, I should have done that this afternoon. And look, there isn't a single rainbow left in Lanesboro Park Pond. So those have all been eaten. That's a lot of possession limits, five, five trout of your possession. Um, South Branch Root, uh, let me see, are any of them interesting there to you? Dushy Creek gets a good parcel of them. Rush Creek uh, gets them all the way almost just above the mouth of Pine, where Pine comes in. North Branch Whitewater gets them, at, gets them just below Fairwater. Uh, Spring Valley gets them, um, Spring Valley Creek. Those folks there love it when we drive through town. I've never seen a bunch of people hooping and hollering the DNR is here stocking rainbows. You're just, it's hilarious. So, um, Winnebago, Willow, Riceford Sportsman's Pond is a little pond. Um, I forget how many acres it is. It's maybe just an acre if, uh, but it gets 750 each year. Um, and the locals fish that pretty heavily. Um, so Camp Creek, um, Get some just at the just down by the mouth, the, the first uh, you know half mile of, of Camp Creek gets them. They do move. Um, so let's go to the next. Okay, let's talk about brook trout disease testing here. So this is something uh, that I need to educate you on because I've, I'm getting the feeling people are. People are thinking that bro these brook trout, these heritage brook trout, just fall, just grow on a tree behind the office or something. So, so this is our our disease testing spreadsheet. So, um, 
2009 we started testing you can't you can't take fish from the wild and put them in a state fish hatchery it's against our our policy it might even be law it might even be a dnr rule can't remember i don't work on the hatchery system but um, you just can't do that so these they have to be disease tested when we disease test trout we disease test them um we we have to euthanize 30 of them and they all get shoved into a cooler in a bag and taken to the path lab path, path, path lab in st paul our fisheries has their own path lab so um and that the same day when I mean, they literally have to do it the same day we shock them in the morning put them in a cooler and drive up right now they're fresh as fresh could be um so a pass means they passed the disease testing an f means they failed the disease test testing uh, most of the failings are due to bkd bacterial kidney disease um, it's very common. In fact, we think it's everywhere down here. Um, it's in all of our streams. Um, fish have it, but don't necessarily um, exhibit signs of it. It's not dangerous for us if we eat the trout, uh, but it, it, if in certain situations, especially in a hatchery situation, uh, it can kill huge numbers of fish. Uh, so we don't want them in the, in the hatchery if they, if they fail. So you can see um, the first three lot, three rows up there are in chartreuse. Those are all uh, Rush Creek watershed. Uh, the blue ones below it are all from South Fork Root. And then we have one uh, heritage brook trout population. Um, let me get some more admittance here. We have one uh, brook trout population that we're, we're, we're getting to in you know, East Indian Creek, East Indian Creeks in East Indian Creek is in Lake City's fisheries management area. Um, so we just did disease testing on those this last fall. Um, and those fish were then, because they passed, you can see way over there that they passed, um, they were sent to Peterson State Fish Hatchery. So those fish are in Peterson right now. Um, you can kind of see a big gap in there in 2012, 13, 14. That was due to multiple things. Um, you just, hatcheries are usually three years out. It's, you know, that you just can't take a bunch of fish and throw it in a hatchery. Uh, disease testing and then everything is being used that's, be, that's being used. I mean, there's no ex, extra extra waste raceways or extra buildings or extra. So you, you just can't, when you get a fail like that, that 2012, 13, 14 was kind of like a reset um, for disease testing and also for um, hatcheries uh, and which hatchery was going to house the brook trout and how many we needed, et cetera, et cetera. Vaughn, so Vaughn I'm sorry. Can I yep. just ask a question to yep. clarify this graph? Um, yep. So are, do, am I understanding correctly that these streams are streams where there are resident populations of heritage brook trout and the goal here is to take fry or eggs or something from these streams, get them into the hatcheries so that the, you can then reintroduce them to other streams. And in order to do so, you do the kidney testing first before you, there you put go. them in the hatcheries. Yep, everything you said was correct. So okay, yeah, I, did, I didn't describe what I'm talking about. This is heritage brook trout. These streams on this chart are, are all heritage brook trout streams. The brook trout in them have the genetics that are unique to Southeast Minnesota. Um, yeah, so our objective is to take broods, get to collect wild brood stock, uh, collect eggs and or adult fish. We're doing eggs right now because it's easier. Um, mm -hmm. And moving them to the hatchery so that they can be spawned at the hatchery and their, their kids can be reintroduced. So yeah, you were, you were correct. Into these streams or into other no, streams? I'm sorry, yeah, into other streams. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. These would these would the, yeah we wouldn't put them back here necessarily. The the one of the actually it is kind of bizarre. The one of the problems that we've had. You can look here. Um, all the ones in blue basically. Uh, well, no, all this, all the ones in in the Lanesboro area. So Schuler has there anybody been to Schuler Creek recently? Out of Rushford there. It looks like fifteen high school kids were given fifteen bulldozers and we're allowed to drive up and down the creek for a couple of days. I mean, it's just completely obliterated. 
uh, and we went back in 2019 and 18 and tried to find it was 2017 when that that had a big flood through there um and we went back and, and we couldn't find any I, i'm sure they're there it's hard to get rid of they're almost like cockroaches brook trout are pretty tough so um 2018 you know we couldn't even find 30 to disease test you know i'm i'm not really big on taking if we can only if we collect 31 i'm not for taking 30 killing them and taking them up to the path lab what good does that do so um, a lot of those empty spaces in Lanesboro's chartreuse and blue were from were from just not finding adequate numbers of brook trout because of flooding in 2017 and 18. So we're going to get back into it here. Um, as I said, there are the, the positive part of this is that we have East Indian um, uh, eggs in the Peterson State Fish Hatchery right now. So uh, that's a good thing. So ju also just to remind you, you know, these are reintroductions. So when we take these these young from East Indian Creek, we'll, we'll do them Reintroductions are usually three years. So we'll usually take uh, three years of, of reintroductions. So if, if we get um, little guys in 2021, we'll stock those in 21, 22, and 23, and then we'll stop for 24 or 25, and we'll take a look at it in five and six and see how it's going. It isn't a stocking per se, as you do it every year, you just keep on throwing them on there no matter how well they're doing. You know, reintroductions are, are three years and then coming back and looking. Uh, let's talk about fisheries activities here. So, um, as you know, we have COVID. So COVID affected state offices pretty, affected DNR pretty strongly. Um, so most of us, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, those that can are, are, are working from home. I'm in my office now giving this presentation because of the great internet I have here. Um, but our electrofishing work was was limited to just three people we normally shock uh, with six seven eight nine people so that kind of killed us there that pretty much ended our, our stream assessment program for the spring and then um, eventually killed it for the fall too um, we were able to do some recon work for brook trout uh, with backpack shocker i haven't gotten that information yet but uh, we did do some i know the guys were out so um positive that was a that's a negative positive thing is that we were able to so we had uh, last uh, January we hired we, we were about to hire we had interviews for three uh, creel clerks and we were about to hire them in about March send them a letter um, welcoming them to the DNR and we were told to immediately stop um, and those people had to be told that they know what they they they, they weren't going to get a job even though we kind of it wasn't officially offered to them, but they, you know, it's just not good. So uh, the positive part of that, though, is that the area staff now had plenty to do. So four of us were assigned to the work of three crew clerks. So that left me with one or two days each week for me to do other the other tasks that I normally would do in a week. So I was pretty plenty busy this this uh, summer. Um, Creel surveys we do. We've done one in 2005, 2013. Uh, we're going to do another one in hopefully in 2021 here, hopefully with three career clerks that we hire. So, um, also I spent a lot of my summer with some of the staff here working on trout stream designations. So I'll go through that in a minute here later, but, uh, that took a big part of my time as well. So let's talk about that, that trout stream designation stuff. So I don't want to get into this too much because it's frankly to me, it's very boring, but, um, uh, so the DNR has rulemaking authority. In other words, they have some authority. We have some authority to make rules. We don't need necessarily anybody's say. We're able to make our own rules. Uh, I, I don't know if all state agencies can do that. I, th I think it might be unique to DNR. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that we can just go making rules like nobody's business. We still have to be accountable to what we do. So, um, and it's very, it goes very political very quickly. Uh, it leaves my biological bubble and goes into politics. So the DNR commissioner basically dictates when we when we fall into that mode. 
uh, uh, Sarah Strauman right now, when she, when she decides maybe this next summer, she'll decide this might be a good time to go into rulemaking mode and we can start doing these designations. Um, so the last time we did this, we did this in 2016 and this office was able to add 19 more miles, a little bit more than 19 more miles to our total tr designated trout stream miles down here. So that's a good thing. Um, it requires a lot of paperwork as most things in state government do. Um, so we stream uh, fish population assessment, a lot of electrofishing, uh, all the all of them, all, all the designations require water temperature data. A lot of forms I fill out, a lot of maps I have to make, and then I have to write a new stream management plan that says that this should be designated. So currently on, on my designation proposal that I've written right now, we have 34 streams that are on the list um, that are ready to go to central office here very soon. And that those are about, it's about almost 84 miles, 83 miles of new designation. If, if all those streams go through, it would be an additional 83 miles of designated trout streams in Southeast Minnesota. So that would be awesome. Here's what those little temp loggers look like. They're about the size of a quarter, maybe four or five quarters stacked on top of one another. Uh, they're very simple, uh, very simple things. Uh, we, we put them in the, in, in under the water, obviously, on, attached to some fence wire, hide them in rocks underwater. Um, I've, I have had some anglers pull them out. I suspect they're anglers. And, oh, what's this? And they throw it up in the bank, and I find it in the bank someday. But I've gotten real good at hiding them. So if you see one of these, please just leave it where it is. Uh, it's there taking water temperatures. I've set these for, we normally do every 15 minutes. So it does, we have water temperature data every 15 minutes, 24 seven for six months. Um, they're really important little tools. They're about 85 bucks a piece. Uh, not cheap, but very helpful. So here's just to give you some idea. So this is Bear Creek. Bear Creek flows, it's just uh, west of Spring Grove. Um, So we've got, so the brown section of the graph, the background is is water temperatures that are lethal to brown trout. The yellow section back there is, is those water temperatures that are stressful to brown trout. And the blue are those water temperatures that are in the range of growth for brown trout. So you can see that all the water temperatures that were collected on Bear Creek here are all in the range of growth. So that's a good thing. So currently Bear Creek is not designated as a trout stream. Um, so obviously with this water temperature stuff, it could be. So uh, we, we do, uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency does a lot of, of water temperature monitoring and they do some fish monitoring down here too as well. So we share data quite often. I work really well with PCA folks and uh, they get our data and we get theirs. So you can see their data is on here with ours as well. Let me just show you a couple more here. Bloody Run Creek. I don't know what happened on Bloody Run Creek way back in the day, but it probably wasn't good to get a name of Bloody Run Creek. I don't know if that's Civil War stuff or what that was. Yikes. Uh, Bloody Run flows into Willow. Willow flows into South Branch Root. So you can see that's plenty cold enough. Here's a picture of Bloody Run. I don't see any blood, but that's sort of early spring, this early spring. Plenty big enough. Here's Dushy Creek. So this is an interesting thing here. We've got I, I would imagine everybody here's fish Dushy Creek. It's right from my office here. Um, there's a, a tributary way at the headwaters that is almost the same volume of water coming in, and many sections of that of that tributary are not designated as trout water. Um, and I've always wondered that that was the oddest thing. But uh, here, here's here's temperature logger data from uh, from both from these loggers are about maybe 100 yards away from one another. One's up one creek and one's up the other. Uh, so the trip is just a little bit warmer, but it's kind of interesting how it follows. Almost exactly the, the same form as, as does the main dushy. Here's where the trip comes in. You can see what the problem is here. This was, uh, this may have been this spring or last spring, I can't remember, but there the trip is on the right and the main dushy is on the left. All that mud coming in. We have some cow issues up the trib, so um, let's just say we're working with it. I'm working on it. 
Uh, here's our Kedron Creek. Some of you may have fished Kedron. It's a great stream. It's got some monsters in it. Monster brown trout, that is. Uh, this is a little trib way up at the upper headwaters of it. Um, obviously suitable enough for trout. Uh, some of you may know this one. This is Marnack Creek, if you know the Marnack House behind the Whitewater Wildlife Management Area. There's a, a, a settler, I don't know if they're Finns or Norwegians or what they are, but they were one of the first settlers in the Whitewater Valley and they've got a, there's their old limestone house way back in there that you can go and it's a nice walk, a uh, summer walk or even a fall walk for grouse, it's a good walk. Uh, but Marnack Creek is a creek that is in that valley and I've always known I had trout, but the most of it is in the wildlife management area, in the whitewater management area, so I don't really have to, I'm not too concerned about it, I guess. If it's in a wildlife management area, I don't have to be concerned about too many cows, sewage, whatnot, getting into it. So it's, it was kind of a low priority, but it's on the list this time, so. So this is uh, Pine Creek. There's, we have two Pine Creeks down here. We have one Pine Creek that goes into Rush, Rush Creek. And then we have Pine Creek, we call it Pine Creek, New Hartford, goes to the little town of New Hartford. Little town means three houses. So um, it flows directly into the Mississippi. Uh, PCA um, labeled this this last year as a cool water stream. So we're kind of following them here. In this case, other times they're following our lead. So we switch back and forth, but um, they were way ahead of us on this. Got some data from them from 13, 2013 and 2014. So that'll be a nice, a nice addition. Um, so let's talk about the Creel survey here just for a second. So that, that was Sylvan Park Pond in Lanesboro, by the way, right there. Uh, that's during one of our annual fishing events. That isn't normally what you see there, but um, that was, that's during one of our June fishing events that we held there. So the Creel survey, um, it was supposed to be April 1st to September 30th, but because of COVID, we weren't able to start until July. Um, the streams that, that I chose were those streams that we stock rainbow yearling in. I was kind of interested in seeing, we had, a, we had a big interest in seeing who was using a rainbow trout yearling stocking, who they were, why they were there, where they came from, et cetera. Uh, and we also included some streams in the creel that were from past creels, just to give some baseline information on. So you can see the streams there on the right. Uh, those are the streams that we included in our survey this year. Um, I could give you a whole presentation, well, and I could give you this next spring if you really want to hear all about creel surveys, I'd give you a whole. I've just started grinding out the numbers. We're still actually getting stuff back from anglers. Uh, I just got some in the mail today. As a matter of fact, some surveys that we put in our windshield. So I'll, I'll wait here until Christmas and then January 1st, I'll hit the hit the end button. But I've got three slides here that just give you some idea of some basic things that we learn, which I find fascinating again, because this is what I do for a living, but you may not think so, I don't know, but uh, I'll show it to you here. So here's three slides, this one. So there's five Creel surveys there, well there's four, 2000 or 1998, 2005, 2013, 2020. The listing there in the rows are, are the percent of anglers that we surveyed in the Creel that were Minnesota residents or other residents, other meaning anything other than Minnesota. Um, so I, I would have thought that because of COVID, our other in 2020 there would have been a lot less than 2013, 20, 2005. It's about the same. So that's kind of weird to me, but uh, it, COVID didn't seem to stop our non-resident anglers. Um, here's a, a thing by age. I always think this is really interesting to me. So the columns, if you added up all the columns here, they add up to 100. The sample size is the last row, just to give you an idea. We did sur survey three anglers in their 80s see back in the bottom right hand corner. But it's kind of interesting. So if, if you're wanting, for example, if, if Benji wants to target uh, recruitment outreach to anglers less than 16, um, he shouldn't necessarily necessarily do it with a fly rod. He should 
um, pay attention to bait anglers. You know, 49.4% of those less than 16 years old were using bait. Um, I'm 54, so if you look in the 50 to 59 category, I'm, I'm a fly angler, 34.7%. I'm, I'm the norm, I guess. Um, nothing really interesting, nothing really weird, I guess. That's all really interesting to me, but nothing really out of the, I, I could have predicted this. Um, you look at lure anglers, that's typically the norm. Usually it's actually a lot younger than I thought. It's usually the 20 and 30 year olds that are, that are, have a high percentage of, of lure angler. Um, and the mixed, the mixed row there, by the way, is, is mixed, meaning mixed method, meaning, um, there were guys using fly rods with a night crawler. There were guys using spinning rods that were throwing bait and then also lures. Um, so there were a combination of different gear types. Okay, uh, this is interesting. So the, again, the columns add up to 100%. So a local, we, we, we had to break it down. So this is just Minnesota residents. Local anglers are those people that live in those counties listed in the, in the heading there. Metro anglers were considered those anglers listed in, in those counties. And then other was any other county other than those above. So if you can look, we, we get a lot of whining sometimes about, uh, for example, let me find a good one here. So um, Metro anglers will say, well, it's all those local bait anglers that are down here screwing everything up. Now that isn't the case. If you look at the Metro column there, there's more Metro bait anglers than anything else. And we get the same, same vision too. We don't get this as much as we used to, but when I first started here, we, we got a lot of whining about local local bait anglers whining about those metro fly anglers coming down here and ruining our fishery. You know, so these are the social things that I get to deal with, but it it comes out in this in this type of a table here is is usually not what most people think. Uh, let me go to easements here. Got a couple more slides here, and then I can go through these questions. Um, so, as you know, we have, I, th I think most of you know that we have state angling easements in Southeast Minnesota. We have them all across the state, actually. There's more miles, miles of state angling easements in Lanesboro's area than any other area. I think there's, there's a little bit over 250 right now, miles of trout stream angling easements. Um, Oh, this is important here. This this is extremely important. This is an important slide for you guys. So I'm working on right now the new, our new 2021 paper booklet, our trout fishing opportunities booklet. I've been told we have the money and I've been told to go ahead and get it done. So I'm working on that right now. So these will hopefully be available to you for free um, start, and hope my goal is 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 March of 2021 um, however we have something that you can use today that may for some of you anyway may outuse any booklet that you have if you go to the main DNR website and the top right window you type in AMA which stands for aquatic management area which is what easements are I think it's the fourth thing that comes up in the search that is the AMA finder. It's really pretty cool. I, I could actually bring it up here on my computer and show you, but it, it can sort by county and then it can sort by other things. And you can pull up your whole screen with an aerial view of the easement. And you can see exactly the fence line of the walk-in, for example, to an easement. You can see exactly where the easement ends and where it stop, starts. It's really valuable. Um, so for easement acquisition, it's important to know these things. So before anything, before anything, anything happens, we have to have a willing landowner. Without a willing landowner, without a landowner that is willing to sell an, us an easement, we can't, we, this is an eminent domain thing. And you'd be really surprised at the number of, of landowners that say, no, I'm not interested. You'd think, you'd think, a lot of us maybe would think that that would be a, no, a, a great thing. 
get paid eighty thousand dollars for some property and have it get fished by twelve people for an entire year. Uh, but it's not always the case. So the first thing is willing landowner. Um, the valuation for it. Um, I've got a slide coming up here that shows that will show you how I, I, we, we do it. It's in statute how we give a valuation. I, I, I just don't come up with some value. Um, it's basically, it's based on the average paid dollar per acre in the township from the previous year. So I'm using 2019 um, information. Plus it adds to that $5 per each linear foot of stream on that parcel. So as I said, this is non-negotiable. Uh, the landowner can't say I, I can offer them ninety four thousand two hundred and thirty six dollars and fourteen cents, and they can say no. That sorry, I, I want I want two hundred thousand for it, or I want ninety five. I want just a little bit more. Uh, they 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 can take it or leave it. Uh, this is written in statute. I can't give them more money. Period. Paragraph. So the process. So if the landowner says yes, I am willing. I am a willing landowner. Uh, the process for this is usually about nine to twelve months. Um, the reason it takes so long, it, you, you would think you could get something done in a week. I mean, when you buy a house, it seems like things go awful fast, uh, relatively. It doesn't take 9 to 12 months to buy a house, but uh, it does for the state to buy easements that are perpetual. So uh, the, the, the easement basically is purchased by staff in the Lands and Minerals Div Division of Lands and Minerals. They actually have realtors there that, that know their thing, that have some law background and um, are really I, we've got some we've got two really really good uh, women that are way efficient at getting these things done um, some of the problems that we've been having and you'd be surprised again I think unless you've maybe bought a couple of homes in your life um, how many of the deeds of these parcels are broken you know the guy to the north says that he owns the slice of land and your deed says that you own it for example so the dnr does not buy an easement on a, a deed that has defects we're not going to do it so the landowner will probably have to spend the money hiring a lawyer hiring a surveyor and the two landowners will have to agree that actually the line is here and not here and that was a that was a something wrong in the in the deed um so that takes months so some of these, we just had one, I think that's closing here soon, a couple of weeks from now that um, the landowner had passed away and the trust was still in court. The family was suing each other for who has had the, who owned the property. And it was just, and the people were in Wisconsin and the deed was, had a defect in it. And you know, just went on and on. I'm like, oh my God! I, I there's um, the Brittany, our one of our realtors. She just hammered that away, and she's gonna. I think she's gonna close on it uh, in the next couple of weeks here. So that that was not fun. But um, anyway, so here's an example of an easement. I just made this up. This isn't. I made it up. So don't try to think anything in this. So assessed value per acre. Um, that's the 2019 information. Uh, you can see uh, an acre in Sheldon Township went on the average for three thousand eight hundred and fifty-two dollars and forty-one cents. So I measure the I measure using GIS the stream length. Our easement corridors are in, in ninety-nine percent of the cases are one hundred and thirty-two foot wide, sixty-six feet from stream center to the left and sixty-six to the right. So sixty-six times two. Uh, I convert that from square feet to acres. And then the macro behind that one cell there basically takes the number of acres times the $3,852.41 and gives me a value. The easement value is the addition of the $5 per foot. Remember I had, I said it was also $5 per foot, stream foot. So that's how the value comes up. So the one thing in there that would be interesting to you is the, so you see some in there that were walk-ins. So there's some corridor widths in there that are 10 feet wide. We normally buy our walk-ins at 10 feet wide. Um, those don't get, because they're walk-ins, they're not on the stream, they don't get the $5 added to it per, per foot, as you can see. Um, and they're not worth a whole lot of money. I mean, if $886 was sitting on the floor in my office, I think I'd pick it up, but uh, relative relative to the easement, 
value, they're not they're not uh, a big thing. We've never yet had an ang uh, a landowner say, "Well, I don't want to have a walk-in on my easement." If they ever if they ever did, I would just say, "Okay, well then we're not interested in the easement." I don't, I don't want to purchase easements that anglers can't access, or I don't want to purchase easements that where you can't get to and easily fish. Um, back in the day when many of these easements were purchased, landowners in Southeast were uh, more free with their trespass. It wasn't a big thing to see ang anglers walking across farm fields to get to the stream. It wasn't considered a big thing. Now it's Call the sheriff. Call the CO. Oh my God! Somebody walked across my corner. It's, it's a little, little bit uh, difficult these days. So we're buying walk-ins just to let you know that we're buying walk-ins whenever we possibly can. If there's a little dry run or a little tributary or a little fence row, um, I include a walk-in on it because to us, it's nothing relative to the price of the easement. So. Here's my little pitch. Um, so here's here's the bump on the log. So in order to purchase easements on trout streams, we need willing landowners. I've already said that. So in my example of Spring Creek or Spring Valley Creek, um, I sent letters to 11 landowners on Spring Valley Creek uh, in 2016 or 15, maybe. None of them, none of those 11, none of them wanted to sell an easement. I can't force them to buy an easement. So that's one example. That's another one extreme. If we, I usually, if I send out 20 letters, I'll get somebody interested. At least somebody will want to talk about it. We got zero. Um, the other example is um, if you fished Winnebago Creek, you know, a Bird Creek, and you might know a New York, New Yorker Hollow. Um, we thought there would be no way in beep that we would ever get an easement on Jim Berg's property. Jim would not let us access it to Electrofish. He didn't. He actually charged anglers to go on the property. I know people that have given him a 20, given him a 100 so they could fish it for a week. I never thought we'd ever get an easement from him in my career. He came in one day uh, about four years ago, three years ago, I'm in my office here, and Ron is in, in his office, no COVID then, and I, I'm Jim Berg. Can I speak to somebody about selling an easement? I, I just about choked in my office here. I I didn't even go out in, the, in that thing because I heard Ron. Ron jumped up, and Ron didn't know who he was, didn't know what he – he didn't know him from Adam. Uh, but Ron went out and talked to him about it, and I can hear just about everything in my office here and uh, basically ended up selling an easement on every single trout stream on all of his parcels in the Winnebago Valley. So that's another extreme. So there might be times when I spend a couple days driving around looking for uh, easements to purchase good stuff like on Spring Valley Creek and nobody replies. And there might be other examples where I'm sitting in my office doing other work and somebody that we never would have thought wanting an easement comes flying into the office and sells us one. That's happened more than once. So to move on here, in order to purchase easements, we need funds. I, we don't have a tree in the back of the office here where we can just go pick a couple hundred thousand off and buy easements. So the only funding source that we're really using right now is Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Funds. And again, Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council doesn't just give you those funds. You have to ask them. You, you have to make a proposal like Trout Unlimited does, like John Lincheski does for his habitat projects, and ask them for money. Um, requesting funds, as I say here, are, for any easements has not really been a priority for DNR Fisheries. I don't, I don't know why this is. I don't know what, what it's about. Um, it just hasn't been a very big priority. I've repeatedly said to Central Office Fisheries that if I had, if I knew if Vaughn knew he got $250,000, let's just say, to spend on easements every year, I know I know how much effort it takes for me to get rid of that $250,000 in easement acquisition. The problem that's been in the past is that we've we would we would not request funds. 
for one or two, three years. And then all of a sudden we request for a million dollars and we'd get 500. So I'd have 500,000 to spend on easements. And then we'd not request money for one or two, three years more. And then we'd ask for another million and we get 500. We always, it's always the big thing to, they, they give you half of what you, they think they're in control or something. I don't know what the, I don't, I don't play that politic game, but uh, that's, that's the way they play it. So um, if, if we asked for 300,000 every year and we were given 300,000, there was no games played here. Uh, I could get rid of it. I'm convinced that I can get rid of it. So uh, if you want this to be changed, this is my request to you guys. Uh, you can get together as a chapter or you can get together. It's probably good to get rather ready for uh, um, or, or get, get this in, in individually. I would, I would think that an, an individual's name would be, in my opinion, would have more clout than, than a chapter. I'm not saying the chapter not to do it, but I'm saying in addition, I, it would be nice if, 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 you know, Bob Luck's letter was sent rather than just Twin Cities to you. Um, so here, I'm gonna, I'll send this to, to whoever, I'll send it to Jeff, if, if Jeff needs it, or Janine actually knows it. So if, and, and it's not, it's not a thing that, it's nothing that Brad Parsons has done wrong. I, I, I don't, I don't want you guys to think that he, he's against easement acquisition. Um, he's just one of many players asking for Lasarge Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council funds. So if, um, yeah, don't, don't send Brad a nasty gram, please. Uh, just, it would be nice if at least a couple of you in the chapter sent Brad a nice letter, real simple, one paragraph requesting DNR to get um, funds. So with that, there's my email address and my office phone number. Um, I've talked to some of you, so I'm, I'm going to go through the questions here. Does that sound a good idea? Yes, why don't you do that? Uh... Uh, Vaughn, thank you so far for your presentation. There's a lot of great material in here. And with your permission, we will be sharing uh, this uh, with our membership and we'll be sure to highlight the, um, uh, where to write regarding easements. Okay, yeah. If you have questions on, if you want me to proof it or anything, uh, please just ask me. Uh, let me look here. Let me find, yeah, I should have done this way. Da, 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 da. So first one, Tom asks, how is natural production on Weisel? Um, Weisel's natural production is usually pretty good. There's always, there always is some. Um, the reason we are, we're still continuing stocking it a little bit is because it's not always solid. There are some real weak year classes. Uh, I don't, we don't know the reason why. I, I don't, I, I've tried to, we've tried to figure that out since many of us have been in this office, but we don't know why that'd be the case. Uh, you mentioned that stocking brown trout fingerlings does not affect the population of fish trout. Uh, no, it does. It, it could. If so, what do we do to influence the DNR to stop stocking brown trout and put the resources elsewhere? Okay, good question. So you mentioned that stocking brown trout fingerlings does not affect the population of the fish trout. It does, without a doubt. Um, when you put a thousand of something in a stream where, where yesterday they wasn't, there wasn't a thousand of something, it's definitely, it, it has some effect. Now, whether it's a negative effect or whether it's, or whether it's noticeable by an angler or it would be a electrofishing assessment, I, I, we don't, it, it depends on the year. There's so many factors that are controlling that, that it's impossible really to, to say. Um, stop stocking, basically. Um, resources elsewhere. I guess I, I need more. I, I need something clearer than that. Um, we're spending quite a bit of money on our hatchery system. Uh, right now we've got construction going on, not right this very minute in the dark, but um, so I, I don't want to make it sound like we have to stock because we're spending money on hatcheries, but it's such an easy thing to do. Uh, it, it says here, put the resources elsewhere. I guess I need to, I need information on what that means. What, 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 where, what are we losing? I wish I could talk to this person. Uh, what was this here? 
Da -da -da. When will DNR hatchery crystal strings be cleared for stocking? It's cleared right now. They've been raising rainbow trout and their uh, staff from this office are working there on Tuesdays and Wednesdays of each week. So they're in full blown trout uh, spawning mode right now. Uh, full mode. Not sure if you care, but I fished Hemingway and Sweet Bottom in September and there were tons of brook trout. Well, that's great to hear. I didn't know that. Um, uh, Coleridge had a huge flood in 2017, the same one that hit Shoulder Creek, um, and it was basically gutted. Um, so Hemingway is a little bit more difficult for us to get to. Uh, so we prefer to go to Coleridge and get the fish from there. Sweet Bottom, um, that's great that somebody's fishing Sweet Bottom. Um, there are some monsters in Sweet Bottom, so glad to see that. When streams have major flooding events, do you see any differences in trout mortality for younger or older fish or different trout species? That's a cool question. So. Um, flooding events without a doubt affect the youngest year class most. Um, you know when we had the Rush Creek flood, what year was that? That was in 2007, 8, 9, somewhere in there, the big Rush Creek flood. There were, we found fish in fit brown trout, not just any fish, large brown trout, meaning 18, 20, 22 inches in puddles of water 100 yards away from the trout stream. They were either still alive, which in case we took them and ran them to the creek and threw them back in, or they were dead and crows had eaten their eyes. Uh, so it's, I would say that mostly it's young fish, you know, little dinky centimeter long fingerling during a March flood when all our snow is thawing isn't going to survive. Um, different species, I, I don't know whether there's a difference. Um, but I, I would definitely say younger fish are more affected by flooding high water events. Uh, great news, I'm assuming that means to be with the, yeah, the Trout Opportunities booklet. I'm a big proponent of this booklet. I'm, f I don't know what my age has to do with it, but 54 years old, I like something in front of me in my truck and I don't wanna have to necessarily look at my phone. I want something where I can write something down with a pencil. Remember pencils, you know, I like to write things down. So I'm a big fan of those booklets. Uh, just to confirm, all easements are also, yes, all easements are aquatic management areas. They're right. Easements are a type of aquatic management area. Um, also to confirm, is there any scenario where an easement has been or could be reversed? No, there has never been one. And in, in my hope, there never will be. Um, are easement payments annual? No, they're, they're they actually, they're, they're, they have several options when they close. The landowner can either choose to have one lump sum or they can choose up to four annual payments. So does that make sense? So one huge payment or one in two years, one annual in two years, one annual in three years, one annual in four years, but we want it done in four years. Um, why are landowners becoming more unwilling to sell easements? I think it has to do with, that's a good, great question. I ask myself that question all the time. So um, I, I wouldn't say that overall landowners are becoming more unwilling. It's just that I think you hit certain streams where they may have had bad experiences with people trespassing or people, uh, they've, gotten the, they've gotten the vision that anglers are bad. And so I don't know, I wasn't there. But I, I think, and the word spreads at the local cafe, you know, don't ever sell an easement to the DNR because those anglers just get on there and they just destroy the place. I, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm just making this up. But I, I think it's little segments of, of streams that are difficult for whatever reason, I, I don't know. I wish I knew. What is the process for, for determining habitat work on easements? So the first, that's a good question for Jim, Melander. So the, the process though starts with, with is habitat limiting? So the DNR fisheries office this is responsible for our management area. So we, we make the decision whether habitat is limiting and uh, then we decide whether or not it's a project that might be best done by Trot Unlimited or whether it's a project that may be best done with us, by us. Um, we usually take 
DNR usually takes the hardest ones. I'm not being mean, but I'm just saying that when there's landowner conflict and uh, a bunch of bunch of stuff going down in the valley, I don't really feel comfortable sending in a bunch of volunteer anglers to help out on a habitat project when when it's a bad situation. So um, that's the first thing is habitat limitations. Habitat improvement is supposed to improve habitat. Um, a gym might be like there, there's a whole presentation on that. So if you have questions about that, you can email me um, and I can, or more specifically, if you want me to go in depth, um, are those rainbows reproducing or is it minimal? So rainbows are not reproducing naturally. If that was the question there, I, I, we don't know necessarily why there are Lee strain. It's a real common uh, rainbow strain used for stocking all across the United States. Um, Arley is spelled A-R-L-E-E. -E. You can look up Arley strain rainbows. Um, we, we have never documented any natural reproduction. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying we've never documented it in the 50 years that we've been doing electrofishing in this office. Do you assess stream populations by size and number per mile? I am familiar with this in Wisconsin. Yeah, so we we create uh, estimates based on uh, on numbers and size per mile. Correct. Um, if Jim wants to send me an email, I can send him an example um, of what a, one of our population assessments looks like. Are you stocking brook trout? Not currently because we don't have any brook trout. Can't stock brook trout. We don't have brook trout. Um, looks like that's it. Anybody else have anything? I'm trying to look around here if there's anything in Zoom. Anything else you guys can think of? Uh, hey, everybody, if you uh, are uncomfortable using chat or don't know how to use chat, if you unmute your microphone, you can go ahead and ask Vaughn a question live, too. Or you can email me, or you can call me. Vaughn, I had a question. Yeah. Martin, how are you? Good. Yeah, you know, I've been uh, looking at this issue on... Let's see. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, let's see. The, the creek and uh, the border of Maurer, Fillmore County, and uh, it is not it is um, not officially on the public waters index. And in Inve fact, inventory. Yeah. Right. Inventory. The public waters inventory. inventory. Yep. So the um, the issue is as to what is required for one, the spring source to be included as part of the trout stream. And I know I've, I've talked with Ron about this, but um, the, it seems as though that there is a disconnect and somehow um, the stream is not considered to be intact with the spring source. And so I've asked about designating tributaries, which they claim tributaries are part of trout streams. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the issue I was um, told by the, um, uh, the section chief there and um, I've spoken with some others that this process of designating tributaries cannot be rushed. And therefore uh, it's not likely that this stream um will will be subject to that process and so anyway that's um what is the connection between designating tributaries and trout streams as part of a public waters index or inventory yeah so yeah. so there's the the bigger the bigger piece of the pie is the public waters inventory and then a section a slice of the pie would be designated trout streams so trout streams are designated by section. So if, I don't know with this case, but I'm, I'm just telling you some facts that the tributaries that are within the section that is designated, section as in township section range, the section, if the section is designated, then any tributary within that section, including the trout stream is also designated. 
Did I answer your question? Right, and apparently that is not acknowledged now that one of the issues is attachment of the buffer rules to trout streams mm -hmm. and Minnesota statutes 103 G indicates that uh, trout streams are to be included in the public waters index just by their status themselves, even if they're not officially designated. And so that's the the well, idea not, is that's not that true. That's not true. They have to be in the designated section. They have to be in the section. Uh huh. It's not. That's not whatever you just said. There wasn't true. You now, can't have a. You can't have a tributary outside of the designated section be a designated trout stream. Right now, I guess the main thing is that. But what I what I was really saying is that if the the public waters inventory doesn't show that a trout stream is on it and that that's the case with with this particular stream and it might be with others too that uh, as you're talking about designating streams but somehow that there's um, a process for designating tributaries to be attached to but but one one of the things uh, you know is is the buffer law protecting a given trout stream and if it's not on the buffer map it might not be protected but according to the statute, it should be if it's a if it's a designated trout stream. Yeah, I, I don't work with buffers, so I don't know the answer to your because question. You talked about some. I don't do buffers. Heard from a neighbor that. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway. Um, buffers is that, old. That seems Bowser. to be. Anyway, I won't ask anymore. It's just that there, the the rule came about through a court case in 1994 that they didn't want to have trout streams not included in the buffer requirements. And that, that was passed to attach that to what is considered to be a public water. But anyway, you, they- You got me, I, I'm again, I'm, I don't work with buffers. I don't, I don't work with right. buffer law. Um, and springs so that know. might put, come into a, a stream, would they be subject to the buffer law? And, and that's a question which, uh, you know, anyway, you, you'd like to see everything protected. And if somehow a trout stream that has a, a stream that comes into it, that's a cold water source, would somehow be outside the boundaries of the, the buffer rule. Uh, can I make a suggestion? I'd like to suggest that if anybody yeah. here on this call has not much knowledge about this subject, maybe they can get a hold of Barton and help to answer his question. Uh, right. Uh, I can move to the next question here. Yeah, yep. thank you very much. We okay. have, uh, I think, four or five more questions that have popped up on the chat. So, yep. so the first uh, one is here. We can, yeah, go yep. ahead. Why is live bait fishing allowed during winter fishing when it is required to release the fish? Um, so it would be, so we don't have bait anglers fishing winter season. Well. The reason I asked it, Vaughn, yeah. is the last couple times I was down to Whitewater, I have found some, you know, kind of heavy sinkers with a hook and a couple of beautiful dead fish lying on the, the edge. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, the regulation I, is the regulation for 365 days of the year. So um, if the general regs allow bait, if the general, if the regulation on the trout stream allows bait, which it does on the whitewater, then you could um, use bait during the winter catch and release season. Um, no. I, I'm, I, that's that would be legal, and I think you know that. That's what you're. That's what you're asking, right? Right. Yeah. But I, I wish it weren't because I hate to see the, <laughs> the beautiful dead fish floating on the edge. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I, very few bait anglers fish. Um, I mean, I've got the I've got the creel data to, to show that that uh, we we bait anglers normally aren't fishing in the winter seasons. So, um, you know, having a few dead fish, you know, like I said, whitewater, whitewater. If if you if I give a presentation on the creel this spring after I'm done with all the work, it, you, uh, I'm I'm not fishing the whitewater ever. <laughs> I wouldn't fish the main, the middle branch of the white water if your life depended on it. I, I just I couldn't believe the number of anglers on that stream fishing it 
and the amount of fish that were taken out. It just it was just unbelievable to me. I, I, each to their own. I mean, each of us have different different needs uh, of what we do in fish, but man, I I was just so turned off by the the number of people that were fishing it was just ghastly i guess i don't know but i don't know what to tell you i mean it's it's legal uh we don't have a barbless rag here anymore as well so it is legal um but again i, I don't really think it amounts you know i mean i'm sure there's there's dead fish here and there but um i'm also i, I guess i'm not too worried about it it's, there's so few fish on the whitewater right now we did an assessment on the whitewater and the crew basically did one run we normally do two runs they did they caught so many fish so little so few fish in the first run that they decided it wasn't even worth their time to to make a second run so there's something wrong going on in the white water in addition to all the anglers that are using it and harvesting trout on it we've got some issues with the swimming pond there um discharging warm water into our trout stream um we had some park staff this spring uh, because of covid damming up the middle branch of the white water to fill up the pond without a water's permit mm -hmm. so that's that's actually a violation <laughs> our own parks did it so it kind of ticked me off and and this winter they promised uh to apply for a permit and make a plan for if this happens again uh, any covid things or any issues with the swimming area that that we're not allowed to just open up the dam and let you know how many hundreds of gallons of water muddy nasty pond water into our trout stream I, I just think that's sad but uh that's another discussion so let me go on here um doo -doo -doo. vaughn i'm sorry i'm going to ask you to answer one or two more questions and okay. then uh then pass any okay. questions that don't get answered perhaps you can uh, uh send emails to those uh answers to those questions that, that popped up at the last minute yeah, or they can email me with the proposal. Yeah, or or, or yeah, please email. Yeah, please yeah. email Vaughn. So I'll let you answer two more questions, and then okay. we're going to wrap this thing up. We have to go. Have to go. Okay. Um, with the proposed streams, is there also work on easements on them? I'm not sure what the proposed streams are. That was probably pertinent to the slide that I had up, but let me go on here. Are you noticing declining brook trout numbers during your survey? Uh, it just depends on where we're surveying. Um, uh, if we were targeting brook trout, I could get a whole bunches of brook trout, um, but we don't we don't do a representative sample of our streams in our assessments, so I, I can't really say to that. Um, man, shortfall next year impact not only on trout. Um, so most of our our funding um, is not uh, general. It's it's all fishing. Most of it's fishing wildlife. Um, excise tax and our license fees um, so a lot of the a lot of the state stuff doesn't directly affect um, DNR um, but that's a whole other presentation in itself there um, last question here any advice on where chapter members could fish so winter season so yeah that's a good one I'll end with this so any advice on where our chapter members could fish during the winter season to spread out the pressure yes don't fish the whitewater. <laughs> uh, go to the south branch of the Root River in Preston. We put rainbows in there that were just as big as the ones that we put in whitewater. Um, just before the just before the the parks and town season, uh, we also stocked Mill Creek just before that. Um, Spring Valley Creek probably in town there is open town park season. Um, there's probably I don't know for a fact, but there's probably numerous rainbows available for you in there. Um, I usually like myself go to the go to Forestville um, and fish either Canfield or the, the lower end of, of Forestville Creek. Um, big Browns come up there in the in the fall here and spawn, so they're most likely up Canfield and Forestville Creek right now as we speak. Um, anything else? Other questions? Thanks for thanking me. Um, if you, again, if you have questions, you can email me. I, I, I'll spend all this next week if you if I have enough, and answering all your questions. So, uh, appreciate uh, you guys attending the meeting. It looks like we had how many did we have here? I think we had eighty five. I saw eighty five. Oh, fifty eight people. Wow, full house. Great. Well, thanks again, Vaughn, for attending. Um, 
all of you in the reaction button, if you could give Vaughn a thumbs up. Or, yeah, or you could actually use your actual thumb on your hand if you don't feel like using those silly icons. But uh, thank you so much for taking time to hear Vaughn's presentation. And we uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully at the film festival and at future TCTU events. And please take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Is that it?